We're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 16, as you see there on the screen, and uh, we have seven verses to go through. I want you to understand my purpose in presenting this message this morning. Back a few weeks ago, now a few months, I sent out to each of you who were not able to come by the office a copy of a devotional book called Foundations. And the purpose of that is not because I feel like you don't understand these basic doctrines, but because it is essential for a teacher to know the material they would teach. Because I have a, pros a, a proposition for each of us that each of us accept the challenge of discipling another individual for the glory of God. Discipleship sometimes is viewed as a class in a church, Sunday school class. Or a series that you do in a book, kind of like what I sent to you. And then when it's done, you're done. How many of you really think, you can indicate by raising your hand, or however you think is appropriate, how many of you really think that an individual who goes through a course of study for, let's say, uh, 6 to 12 weeks, is now a mature Christian? I'm glad no one responded in the affirmative. Now, that's obviously not the case. Maturity takes time. When do we stop needing discipleship? When do we need to stop growing in likeness to Jesus Christ? When we're in heaven. In this life, we don't get out of it. We're always in school. There's always something more to learn. I can learn from you. You can learn from me. Most of the time when we talk about discipleship, as I've indicated, it's a short-term prospect. But I believe in the providence of God, it is to be a long-term proposition. This message kind of gives us the basis for that. As we understand Christ's statement, I will build my church. That's a powerful statement that is essential for each of us to understand if we are to progress in what is disciple making. We need to understand that it is Christ's ministry through us and nothing else. I want us to look then at verse 16 and uh, verse 13, I'm sorry. It says, when Jesus came into the coasts of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? This question is the basis for what, uh, on which everything else is constructed here. But I want you to understand about discipleship a few things. When churches cease to function biblically, it leads people in church and out of church to conclude that Christianity does not work. Do you say that's a fair assessment? If our church is dysfunctional, it will lead people in the church and out to come to this conclusion. But the Word of God doesn't leave us there. It seems to many of us that it is the good churches that are shrinking and only those who teach false teaching that are actually growing today. And the question is, is that necessarily a sure thing? Is that the way it has to be? And I don't think for a moment that it is the way that it needs to be. We have the opportunity of following the scriptural pattern for church growth within a church so that we can see numerical growth. I put it as a question. Is it possible today? Is there a right way to do church that will result in God's blessing and our Ability to see numeric growth. Numeric growth obviously is not the be-all and end-all of everything that uh, is to, that has to do with church growth. Uh, there is spiritual growth as well, and that is a very important concept. But you're, we're asking the question: Then, is it still possible to see churches grow in a good conservative church today? Is it possible for Mountain View Bible Church? to grow as God uh, 
has things arranged in today's world? And I believe the answer to that is an absolute and resounding yes. So we come then to the question, is Christ building the church today? He said, I will build my church. But is he doing that? If he is, where is he doing it? How is he doing it? When is he doing it? Is that just something in the past? Is it something for the present? There are a lot of questions that we'll unpackage as we get through this. So as we enter the text, we find Jesus Christ going with his disciples to Caesarea Philippi. And as I've titled it here, he is, he is confronting pagan religion. Caesarea Philippi was just an amazing place, even in Christ's day. I say amazing in a negative context. Uh, because as Christ is there, what, what they're seeing is, uh, is something you will probably will not believe. It's located at the southwest flanks of Mount Hermon, that is the area of Caesarea Philippi. It was enlarged by Philip the Tetrarch, that's where the Philippi comes from, named for Tiberius Caesar, that's where the Caesarea comes from. Uh, but it was, though it was designed to be a resort town with springs and fountains and everything, it had degenerated into really a center of paganism. But Christ could have avoided it. And we'll see his journeys, and what I mean by that, he could have avoided going to this area. But he chooses deliberately to go there because he is not intimidated by the error that is being taught and represented in this area. As I mentioned, it's a center of pagan worship even back then. A temple to the god Pan. I hate to mention pagan gods from the pulpit. But it's necessary for us to understand. I will, I'll tell you that I'm eliminating about six others I could mention. That were also located in there. Various cults of all sorts and types of debauchery. That degraded people. And just were absolutely deplorable by any moral standards. And to imagine this is contained within the nation of Israel. It's under Roman control. Yes. But this had been going on for quite some time prior to Christ coming in his ministry. The Grotto of Pan, or the cave that you see in the background, had a stream flowing from it, and this was believed to be the gates of Hades, the gates to the underworld. That phrase is going to be interesting as we continue on through the text, and it tells us a little bit of why Christ chooses the words he chooses, because he is confronting something. He's confronting a known error, error, heresy, whatever you want to call it, that's been going on in the nation of Israel for quite some time. But to get to that, Christ, first of all, is going to test his disciples with a very important question. There at the end of verse 13, whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So Christ is asking for the opinion of the world at large. The background of that is Christ is in the middle of his ministry. Matthew chapter 16, it's you know, a little bit more than halfway in the, the book of Matthew. Uh, that's not strictly chronological uh, in the sense of the, the volume, the amount of material that's covered per year. But the point is that Christ is in the middle of his ministry. It's maybe as much as two years into his ministry at the time he comes to Caesarea Philippi. So in this time, he's taught quite a great deal. We have quite a number of the messages preserved for us, even here in Matthew. Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7 is one sermon. So if you think my sermons get a little long, you know, I think that one would have taken a little longer. Uh, it is the Sermon on the Mount, and uh, Christ is giving some very... Basic instruction, and yet instruction that's found to be su surprising and new to people who haven't been taught this way for quite some time. He's also been doing plenty of miracles, and in spite of all of this, opposition is growing. The opposition was so great that Christ had had to leave the area of Judea, here in the southern part of the map where uh, the, sea, the Dead Sea is located, and he and his disciples then moved full upward toward Galilee, where they would establish the center of their ministry. That really had happened within the first year of Christ's public ministry. So the majority of the ministry is right there in the Galilean area. But even in Galilee, opposition continued. Some of it was fueled by individuals, priests primarily, coming from Judea up to Galilee to make sure that trouble was being stirred up. 
So what does Christ do? Prior to Matthew chapter 16, Christ takes his disciples northwest from there, out of the territory of Israel, to the region of Tyre and Sidon. Matthew 15 verse 21 tells us about this. It was not Christ's primary ministry to minister to Gentiles. He made that very clear, didn't he? And yet, at a time when opposition was building even in the area that was considered his adopted hometown, Christ then goes with his disciples out of the territory of Israel for a very specific purpose, to minister to individuals that he found there, uh, but also to give a little bit of a break to uh, the, the pressure that's building. So in this particular section in Matthew 16, they're returning then to the, Gal the area of Galilee. But notice where they go. They go to Caesarea Philippi. That's not in the direction of Galilee. They're going to have to make another jog down that way. And there were plenty of ways to get to Galilee from Tyre and Sidon without going through Caesarea Philippi. Kind of, kind of reminds us of John chapter 4, doesn't it? When Scripture says that Christ needed to go through Samaria. When every good Jew avoided Samaria like the plague. Here he is seeking out an opportunity to go to Caesarea Philippi. And he asked this question, whom do men outside the group of the disciples, outside of the group of the followers of Jesus Christ, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? What's Christ's purpose in this? He wants to, first of all, draw out a confession of their faith. It's important for a person to know what they believe and to express it audibly. He wants them to verbalize those beliefs. Have you ever noticed that thinking a thought isn't quite the same as hearing yourself express the thought? Sometimes the verbal expression becomes challenged because we fumble over words. But it is often a good idea to rehearse what we're going to put out there for the first time. I've referred to it as sometimes I have a message and I realize I'm going to have to practice what I preach. In other words, I'm going to have to preach it before I preach it. So that without an audience, I can fumble through the issues that I'm going to have to deal with. And so that I can present it in a coherent way when the time comes. But the disciples need to hear themselves say who Jesus is. And it's, this will provide a contrast between the belief of the disciples and the unbelief that surrounds them and is the basis of the opposition that they're receiving, but also that unbelief which is very graphically portrayed in Caesarea Philippi with all of these temples and caves and so forth dedicated to imagined deities. And so what's the answer? They say, some say, in verse 14, that you are John the Baptist. By the way, John the Baptist has already been beheaded by this point. So it would have required resurrection. And people were well aware of that. Some say Elias or Elijah. Others say Jeremiah. Or one of the other Old Testament prophets. They are convinced, many people, that Jesus has come from God. And these would be complimentary titles paid to anyone else than Christ. But when it comes to Christ, each of these descriptions, no matter how flattering they may appear on the surface, is completely inadequate to explain who he is. And so Christ asked them another question, verse 15, but whom do you say that I am? Now this is a question directed at the disciples squarely. Those who have already expressed and demonstrated true faith in Jesus Christ by following with him and by practicing what he has presented as the proper way of life. Peter responds for the entire group when he says there in verse 16, you are the Christ, literally you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. There are two elements to his answer and so I'm going to break it down by halves. What does he mean when he says, you are the Christ, you are the Messiah? He means that Jesus Christ, in his mind, in Peter's mind, in the mind of the other disciples, is the fulfillment of several millennia of prophecies. Going all the way back to Genesis 3 and verse 15, 
That's a long arc of prophecies till you get to Malachi, the end of the Old Testament, both chronologically and positionally in the text. And each prophet or each book along the way added new details about the Messiah. And Peter says, for all of them, that's who I know you are. Consider how amazing that was. That statement is amazing because as Peter looked on Jesus Christ, he was seeing the kind of every man from the Jewish culture. It's just an ordinary looking individual. I'm not saying he was ordinary in no sense. But he looked like everyone else. If Peter, if Peter was disheveled and his clothing dusty from the trail, guess what? Christ appeared pretty much the same way. He didn't have an aura around him that kept the dust of the trail off of him. There was no special power that kept his hair combed just perfectly. If it came time to eat, Christ was right in there with him. He looked like one of them. And yet, as he's been exposed to Christ's teaching and Christ's life, he comes away with this conclusion. Peter isn't the only one, and this isn't even the earliest time when this is realized. Andrew, back, clear back in John chapter 1, when the disciples are being called for the first time to come and follow Christ, he says, we have found the Messiah, the one promised of God. So this was a common idea among them, and yet, the longer they're with Christ, the more they're convinced of that fact. Have you ever been around someone and when you first met them, you had a, a certain impression of them? Perhaps you had the impression of them as being very competent, uh, of being very confident, and then the more you got to know them, the more you saw the chinks in the armor. The more you saw the uncertainty, the lack of competence in this or that or the other. Or maybe it's in a spiritual con uh, comparison. And I would hope it was this way. The first time you met someone, you didn't really have a great impression of their spiritual walk with the Lord. And that the more you get to know them, the deeper you see that walk to be. And the more you appreciate that person's fellowship with the Lord. But relationships produce both results, don't they? Sometimes they're pleasantly surprising. And sometimes... They're devastatingly disappointing. But in Christ's relationship with his disciples, the more they got to know him, the more convinced they became about this identity that Andrew had been apprised of early on. Philip then says, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write. That's the same thing, but adding a little bit more detail to what's going on. These prophecies are Moses and other prophets and so forth, and we're convinced that this is the guy that's fulfilling all of them. And again, this is in John chapter 1. What opportunity have Andrew and Philip had to really get to know Jesus Christ? It's been a short acquaintance, and they were already convinced now, by the time we're into Matthew chapter 16, that has reached a level of conviction. It's still going to be pushed deeper by the Lord as he goes to the cross and the resurrection. But the apostles are getting it. They're understanding who Jesus is. But there's more to what Peter says. He says, you are also the son of the living God. I find it's interesting that the living God contrasts rather sharply with all of the images that would have been around them in Caesarea Philippi. Today there are ruins of these images and columns and temples and so forth. But these would have been impressive structures and decorations at that time. And in the face of that, Peter chooses to use this phrasing, you are the son of the living God. God, the God whose quality is life. 
who gives to all life and breath and all things. Nathaniel also recognized this in Jesus in John chapter 1. He says, you are the Son of God, the King of Israel. Again, I'm impressed by how quickly Nathaniel came to this conclusion. You remember how he got there? When he was brought to Christ, he had originally said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? I mean, you can think of a community like that, can't you? That it's a good place to be from and not to return. That's kind of what Nathaniel's talking about. He's saying, man, that place is rotten to the core. And yet when he comes to meet Christ, Christ says, here is an Israelite in whom is no guile. In other words, he's going to tell you what he thinks. Back up to, can anything good come out of Nazareth? That was the indicator that Christ knew what he said, though he was nowhere close to it. And Philip said, or Nathaniel says, how do you know me? And Christ says, before you were called, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. It's an interesting thought that under the fig tree was a common place for Israelite men to pray. I think it's very probable that that's what Nathaniel was doing. He was exercising devotion to God. And that Christ's statement that he saw him under the fig tree meant to Nathaniel that he knew what was in Nathaniel's heart. He knew what was going on. And this is the result of that conversation. Nathaniel says, you have got to be the son of God. You are to be the king of Israel. Quite an amazing thing for such a short encounter. But he's also the one who shares with us the nature of God. He shares the nature of God with God himself. To be the son of, of a person is to be the heir of that person's quality of life, their character in many cases. The Son of God puts Jesus Christ on a different level. It's interesting to note that in the Old Testament, there are a dozen or so references to God as Father. But there are zero references to my Father to make that personal. And that's what Jesus did. And so the statement, you are the son of God, is not a son of God. You are the direct descendant, you could say, of God himself. Now, we understand that Jesus Christ is an uncreated being. And yet, this is a title that he takes to himself. And allows others to use about him, because it properly indicates his deity. They knew him, in other words, to be God in human flesh. The incarnation of God. Again, that's a striking realization or revelation considering the fact that they had traveled with Christ for so long. And Christ had always been consistent with everything he taught. He had always demonstrated to them the proper way to respond to circumstance, even when their circumstances were difficult. So Jesus then proceeds to answer Peter, and he says, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, or son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Those are Christ's statements to Peter, pronouncing a blessing on him for having come out with the absolute truth concerning the person of Jesus Christ. So there is full acceptation of what Peter has just said. And by full acceptation, what we're saying is that Christ registered no protest to what had been said. If this were in any measure inaccurate, it was his duty to say, no, you're wrong about that. But there's not a word of protest from Christ. In addition, he gives no correction. He doesn't say, well, you know, that's a good thing to say, but... It's just correct on its face. And in fact, as we saw, he actually praises Peter for coming to this conclusion and tells him that this conclusion is not merely a human conclusion, but it is actually divine revelation. God himself has communicated this to Peter. Not audibly. Not in a vision. But that the realization and the conviction of this that came to Peter's mind and to Peter's heart was something inspired and caused by God himself. And you know that's still the case today? 
The Word of God says that no one can call Jesus Christ the Son of God unless God reveals that to him. Oh, you can say the words, but to have that conviction of heart that Jesus is God. And that what he says about salvation is the real thing. And so your heart, your soul is at rest. Because you know that you haven't taken a risk in accepting the salvation of Christ. You've taken the only hope that exists. That is something that only God can do in a heart. And that is tragically why we all know of individuals who have heard many of the same sermons and have had many of the same experiences that we have had, and yet they continue unsaved and rejecting Jesus Christ while we have come to faith in Jesus Christ. Because it requires an act of God for a person to believe, for them to become fully convinced that what God's Word said is the truth. So now Jesus Christ in verses 18 and 19 is going to introduce his disciples, the apostles, to the church. This is the first time the word church is mentioned in the New Testament. It's the first time this Greek word has ever been applied to the group that Jesus Christ is re referencing here at this point. He starts though by saying, you are Peter. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. Then verse 18, I say to you that you are Peter. A word that literally means a rock, Petros. That is a man of some strength. A stalwart. Peter had his moments of stumbling, didn't he? But overall, the man Peter, as we come to a full appreciation of his character, is a man of some strength. Why is it that he's always at the forefront when the other disciples are present? Why is it that he takes the lead? That's his character. That's his strength coming through. You are Peter, and then he says, and upon this rock I will build my church. That's why I put in the notes there that Peter, though his name means rock, is a small rock by comparison to what follows. The second word rock is not Petros, it's Petra. And we'll get to that in just a moment. But he's really highlighting the fact that though Peter is this man of some degree of strength, he is not sufficient to bear the weight of the plan of God. Nor is any individual. This is why it is critical for members of churches not to put their confidence in men, not even the pastor, in an absolute sense. I will never exact from anyone here a pledge that I am 100% in favor of Pastor Vaughn. There have been pastors who have done that. And I think that is in error. Because as someone wisely responded when that was propagated in a na nationwide campaign, are you 100% for X person? Many of you know who that was. Someone wisely responded, I'm not 100% in favor of me. And that's the humility with which we need to approach the Word of God and our own standing before Him. As Scripture says, let he who is strong take heed lest he fall. You're going to have to be realistic about who you are. Peter, though he had some strength, could not bear up under this full plan of God. Yet certainly he was instrumental in the founding, in the beginning stages of the church. And we'll reference that in the message that will be available to you when you leave here. And uh, that's uh, the message, Peter uses the keys, which talks about the keys of the kingdom of heaven mentioned in this text. And what the message does is just go through how Peter was instrumental in the founding of the church and illustrate how this promise is true of Peter, even though he is just a shadow of what is being represented here. But upon this rock, I will build my church. Notice I put rock with a capital letter R to try to give a contrast. And while, let's go back one slide here. You notice the rock that is here, when you broaden out that rock is what's right there. 
in relationship to this, what does that rock look like? Insignificant. It looks really small. And that's the kind of contrast that is going on here in the Greek language. You are Petros. Now I'm going to tell you about Petra. It changes gender. Instead of a masculine gender, which the name of Peter obviously would be, it is now a feminine gender referring to this truth, a concept, word that is feminine in Greek. And we're not really accustomed to that in English, but uh, it doesn't have anything to do with the masculinity or femininity of a term. It just is how that word is referenced. Uh, and the gender of it is feminine. So there is definitely a contrast. It's here's one truth, but here's a bigger truth. And the bigger truth is the fact that Christ says, I will build my church. This rock refers to a ledge, a cliff, or a mountain. And it refers to Peter's great confession of who Christ is. Upon that, the church is to be built. Christ is the foundation stone of the church. That's why scripture says, let everyone be careful how he builds on that foundation. Because he will be called into account. Christ being that foundation. And Christ says, I will build my church. So we're, we're to understand that this way. Christ will build his church. Who will build Mount View Bible Church? Christ will have to do it if it's to be done. That doesn't mean we don't work at it. That doesn't mean we don't put feet to uh, the commands of Scripture. It just simply means that we understand that outside of ourselves is the power that is necessary to make Mountain View Bible Church what God intends for it to be in 2020 and beyond. We can't rest on the laurels of the past. And we can't pine away about what could have been or should have been or might be. Rather, it is for us to realize that Christ still intends to build his church. And he is building his church today, here and elsewhere. Notice that Christ doesn't say, and upon this rock, you will build my church. It is Christ's church. He takes full ownership of it. He wants us to understand the fact that it is his, he will do the work, we cooperate in it, but in the end, it is his blessing that we depend upon. And then he says that the gates of hell, as our translation has it, the gates of Hades, just to go back to the original Greek term, will not prevail against this church. That is a very strong statement, considering that, as we mentioned earlier, the gates of Hades was what this cave was called there in Caesarea Philippi. It was believed that the water that issued forth from the cave came from that famous ri river of the netherworld. I will not even call it by name. Just a lot of hocus pocus that surrounded this. And I wonder if Christ didn't even gesture, gesture toward this cave when he said, And the gates of hell, the gates of Hades will not prevail against my church. As if to say, all the hordes of demon darkness, all of Satan's error and lies, will accomplish nothing against my church. That's a statement of power. And I would have to say this is kind of like bearding the lion in his den. This is going right after Satan. Caesarea Philippi being a stronghold of pagan religion. And pagan religion is satanic religion. Even if Satan is nowhere mentioned in it. So Christ makes it very clear that Satan is not strong enough to defeat the cause or the church of Jesus Christ. This is not to say that individual local churches will not cease to exist. Have you ever thought about the fact that the seven churches mentioned in Revelation 2 and 3 no longer exist today? Not one of them survives to today. So local churches can cease to exist and Christ's promise continues to be true. Because he's talking about something larger than a local church. But every local church which remains true to what Christ has taught can experience the same blessing. I believe that it is the will of God to build up Mountain View Bible Church. Is anyone in agreement with me? Can you hear an amen? All right, good, good. I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad I'm not, I'm not by myself there. <laughs> 
God wants to build up this church. He knows, he alone knows what he wants to do with the church between now and the time of the return of Christ. You, we all know that Jesus Christ could come now. Before I finish the message. We also know that Jesus Christ's coming might be a long time off. Because many, many generations have thought that they were in the last days and that Christ would return in their lifetime. How many of you remember the 1970s? All the movies and all of the preaching and everything. We were absolutely convinced that we weren't going to see the 80s. When the 80s rolled around, I think it shocked many of us. Then the 90s came. And I think actually some people started to fall away from truth because they were so keyed in to this idea that Christ is coming soon and when he kept not coming they assumed something was wrong with the promise rather than their perception Christ's coming might not come for several hundred years yet I don't see how that's possible but I have to admit that it is possible because I don't know the day or the hour neither do you nor does anyone else God himself knows what he has planned. What he can do in this church is only limited by his providence. And then Jesus says to Peter, after saying, you are a rock, but upon a bigger rock I will build my church. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. And I will give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth, literally shall have been bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. So here is a promise that is given to Peter. The, the word is singular, the, uh, the you there, I will give to you. That's a singular word, singular pronoun. But Peter is receiving really on the basis of his being the spokesman for the group. An authority that will belong to the group as a whole and to each individual in that group. And I would say it's an authority that still belongs to blood-bought believers today. What is that authority or that power? Gospel heralds, people who proclaim the gospel, either open heaven to those who believe or they close heaven to those who reject the message of truth. Have you ever tried to give the gospel of Christ to someone and they refuse and you say, do you realize that refusing this is going to keep you out of heaven? You've used the keys. Or if you are uh, in a situation where a person has bowed the knee and trusted Christ as Savior, I always hesitate to say, now you are eternally secure in Christ because I don't know the sincerity, I don't know how deep this decision went. I always tell individuals, when they come to Christ, if you have truly trusted Jesus Christ, then some things are going to change in your life. You're going to find you're not the same person you used to be. You're going to find that things that no, never bothered you before are now going to bother you. Things that you've watched on television, music you've listened to, conversations you've had, relationships you've had, just the way you work, the way you approach life. All of this is going to undergo a dramatic change if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior. And that change will be the evidence to you that the Holy Spirit does indwell you. And that heaven is your final home. That's opening the door of heaven to an individual. And notice again in the text that when we bind on earth, or in other words, when we shut up a person against heaven, they're saying, you're not going to get to heaven because they will not trust Jesus Christ. That shall have been done in heaven. That will be the reflection of what happened in heaven already. Of what heaven already knows to be reality. And when a person comes to Christ, not only is there rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents, there is also the confirmation in heaven, this person's name is already in the Lamb's Book of Life. You see, God's on top of things. He doesn't wait for us to decide things. Rather, He uses us to reveal the will of heaven on earth. That's our responsibility as heralds of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
So we come to a couple final questions to help us wrap all of these loose ends together. We've seen Christ's statement to the disciples, I will build my church. So I ask you, does Christ build his church today? Is he doing it today? How does he do it? Does he do it by mass evangelism? Perhaps. That's a mixed bag, isn't it? Does he do it on foreign fields? Sure he does. Unfortunately, I think sometimes we believe that God is building his church in foreign fields, but he's quit doing so in the United States of America. That is not an accurate reflection. I will build my church, and not even the United States of America will prevail against it. I know it says the gates of Hades, but <laughs> I'm taking a liberty there. Where, when, how, does, does, does Christ just build his church in the past, in the revivals of yesteryear, in biblical times or whatever? No, I believe that he does it even today. Will Christ build Mountain View Bible Church if we will covenant together to seek that blessing? He will. And that's the foundation for what we will call disciple making, not just discipleship. I like to change the, the name uh, of it a little bit because it's a little bit more biblical. We'll get to that in a future study. But understand this, that a proper mentality of how to teach one another the, the word of God, a proper dedication to seeing people along to spiritual maturity is something that goes all the way from first breath to a final breath. From the new birth to glorification or graduation to glory, if you prefer. It's something that shouldn't just be relegated to a Sunday school class or to a limited period of time, or to a small booklet, but rather should be the central focus of our lives. I'll propose this. If we grasp the idea of discipling one another, it won't be long till we'll find someone else who wants what we're experiencing. And you'll add them to your little group. We're not talking about a small group's focus, we're talking about one-on-one. -on -one. One on two. We're talking about the entire church as much as is practical and possible. Learning the word and sharing what we learn so that each may grow to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Jesus Christ. We'll be explaining and exploring more of these ideas through scripture so that as we get to the point where we can actually restart Sunday school, we're going to get right into the Foundations book and um, explore again some of these great doctrines of Scripture to help us fully appreciate what God has given us. And that will give us a sense of purpose in this life that nothing else can. So let's pray that God would energize us to do the work that he still has for us to do. Father, we thank you for your word and the promise of Jesus Christ that he will build his church. We confess that programs don't really work very well. We understand that just getting all excited and eager to go out and reach people with the gospel doesn't necessarily accomplish the task. What we need is steady, faithful obedience. Help us to understand that Scripture does really have the model of how to see your work build. Building in spirituality first. Getting that foundation firmly established and then reaching out to others as our lives change and impact others. Use your word, Lord, to change our hearts, our minds, to prepare us for what you would do through us as a church. We ask these blessings now in Jesus' name.